Good afternoon and welcome to the third and final training in the financial management training series for distressed cities and persistent poverty technical assistance program. My name is Andre Brickhouse and I will be the facilitator this afternoon for our discussion around cost principles and indirect costs. Next slide, please. Here's a little background. I just want to talk about how we got here and why we're actually putting together these training sessions. Basically, our team identified some common issues related to financial management that seem to be reoccurring in a significant portion of the, of the participants' cities in the DCTA program. During the presentation, we will discuss both paid time off as a component of fringe benefit costs and, in trends and indirect costs and explain how implementing methodologies to document and account for these intrinsic costs in a manner consistent with federal regulations will allow organizations such as yours to request reimbursement for costs of this nature from federal, state, and local resources. Next slide, please. Here's our table of contents. Basically, we're going to start off talking about cost principles and those principles that allow you to charge costs to a federal award, whether they're direct or indirect. We're going to move into the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement or the NICRA and what it takes in order to uh, prepare a NICRA in an organization. And then next, we're going to move into the 10% de minimis rate computation. And that's the, um, the preferred methodology that we're recommending in this presentation for a DCTA organization to utilize in order to get reimbursed for indirect costs. And then finally, we're going to talk about the benefits of the 10% de minimis rate. Next slide, please. Here are our learning objectives and what I want you to take away from this, uh, this training series. And the first thing I want you to take away is an understanding of the cost principles and their application. Then I want you to be able to discuss common technical terms as relates to indirect costs and direct costs. And then I want to be able want you to be able to discuss the uh, the two cost allocation options, have an idea what those are, and identify what you perceive would be the best option for your organization in order to be reimbursed indirect costs. And then I want you to be able to define the cost objectives and their importance to the financial management system. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's get into the cost principles and why these principles are the foundation for charging any cost, whether direct or indirect, to a federal program, award, or project. Next slide, please. Okay, these are the cost principles of subpart E of 2 CFR part 200. They must be utilized to evaluate the cost of all recipients of federal funding when assigning, documenting, and allocating any costs that benefit a federal program or project. The first cost principle I want to bring your attention to is the composition of costs, and it's located in two CFR part 200.402. And this is the composition of costs. And it's defined as total costs that can be charged to a federal award, which is the sum of allocable direct costs plus allocable indirect costs, less any applicable credits. Here, I want to uh, focus your attention on any applicable credits. Basically, you have to take any credits that you may have gotten from the vendor and apply that credit to the actual cost that the uh, vendor has gave you the credit for to ensure that the federal award is not overcharged, to make sure that the actual cost that you incurred for that particular asset or for that particular service, less the credit has been passed on to the federal award. The next cost principle is the factors affecting the liability or cost, which is 200.403. And these are eight factor, factors that must be met to 
to consider the cost as allowable to be charged to a federal ruler. And we will discuss all eight factors in the next slide. The next uh, cost principles is 200 413, which is direct cost. And these are relatively simple. This is a cost that is specifically identifiable to a final cost objective, meaning there's a one-to-one -one relationship to the actual cost incurred and the program or project or award that it benefited. It did not, it can only benefit one single cost objective. The next cost principle is located in 200.414, which is identified as indirect facilities and administrative costs. And the definition here is cost incurred for a common or joint purpose, benefiting multiple cost objectives and not readily assignable to a single cost objective. This is basically saying that these costs are so convoluted there is not one single cost objective we can assign this cost to. So it has to be identified as an indirect cost. And then the final um, cost principle I want to bring your attention to is some, uh, actually a series of costs. And it's located in 2 CFR Part 200, and it's between 200-420 to 200-475. And these are the general provisions for selected items of cost. And here there's approximately 55 items of cost that are consistently used by a organization. And per subpart E of the Uniform Administrative Guidance, details of how to treat these items of cost are discussed. And the details are either discussed that these costs are allowable, unallowable, or conditionally allowable. And we'll give you some examples in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Now here are your factors affecting the liability of cost, which is 200.43. And these are your eight factors. And let's go through them individually. The first factor, it must, the cost must be necessary, meaning it must meet the objective of the award. Second factor, basically if a limitation in the cost type or amount is defined in the grant agreement, or the uniform guidance, those limitations must be adhered to. So basically saying that if there is a specific item of cost that has a specific dollar amount that they can only charge to a particular award, although it is allowable per 2 CFR Part 200, your grant agreement says that it's only allowable up to a particular dollar amount. So that's the maximum amount you can charge. Or that cost could be unallowable per the grant agreement, although it's allowable per 2 CFR Part 200. So if the grant agreement actually states that there is something that is unallowable or have thresholds on it, 2 CFR Part 200 will not supersede the grant agreement. Uh, number three, is the cost must adhere to your organization policies and procedures for all awards, meaning that your policy and procedures are going to supersede. You have to make sure that you identify these costs based off of your um, approved policies and procedures in your organization. Number five, number four, I'm sorry. If a cost is deemed indirect for non-federal purposes, it should be indirect for federal purposes. The recipient cannot apply a different standard to federal awards simply because the available funding may be more than that of the non-federal source, meaning that the nature of a cost that you're using in your organization has been identified as direct. So if you're using that same cost for federal purpose, for non-federal purpose, it must be direct because you have identified the nature of that cost is direct. You cannot change the nature of the cost based on the funding that's available. Number five, it must meet the requirements of generally accepted accounting principles. Pretty straightforward. Number six, the recipient cannot pledge expenses incurred as cost sharing or match and apply those same costs as indirect costs. 
It's called double dipping. That's disallowed. Number seven, it must be adequately documented and the uniform administrative guidance discuss what constitute adequate documentation for an item of cost in subpart E of 2 CFR part 200. So you can identify what would be sufficient documentation for each item of cost and that is documented in the regs. And then finally, number eight, the cost must be established within the period of performance. You should not incur the cost outside the grant period of performance because the cost may be disallowed. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about indirect and direct costs. Now, recipient and subrecipient financial management system must be able to track two types of costs. And the first type I wanna bring your attention to is direct costs. And we talked about direct costs in the uh, previous slide, and that's basically costs that can be identified specifically to a single cost objective, and it can be directly assigned to such activities with relatively ease and with a high degree of accuracy. The definitions, again, is in 200.413, a uniform administrative guide. Some examples of some direct costs that can be utilized in your organization or uh, are identified in your organization are salary, wages, and benefits. And these are the wages and benefits of salaried employees that are performing directly on a federal award. So those all would be direct costs because that time is on the federal award. Materials and supplies incurred that benefit only that program or that federal award, and then the travel costs, the architectural fees, and housing rehabilitation expenses. Again, those are costs that are specifically identifiable to that single federal award, hence a direct cost. Next slide, please. The second type of cost is indirect cost per 200.414. And these are costs incurred for a common or joint purpose, benefiting more than one cost objective. And some examples of indirect costs are general and administrative salaries and benefits. These are salaries and benefit that are general and administrative in nature. These are uh, costs or salaries that were incurred in your organization that benefited multiple cost objectives. You cannot define one cost objective that this, these salary and wages benefit. Therefore, it is an indirect cost. So things like personnel administration, HR, accounting, again, benefiting multiple cost objectives, telephone services in your organization, the office supplies that you incur, depreciation of assets that benefit all your awards and all your program, office rents and office building security services. Those are examples of indirect activities that you can charge to a federal program if you had some methodology for charging indirect costs to those programs. Next slide, please. Here are uh, general provisions of cost, and I uh, want to bring your attention to those. Could we say we'll talk about some of those provisions of cost? So, here, are, these are basically in this section from 420 to 476. There's actually 55 or 56 items of cost here. And it talks about those costs that are occurred in an organization, such as an organization in the DCTA program. And then it talks about how you would treat those specific items of cost. In, uh, in the organization if they incurred. And some, and then in the, in the regs, it specifically says whether these costs are allowable, unallowable, or conditionally allowable, depending on the circumstances for incurring the expenses. Now, some examples of these types of costs that are in the regs 
I want to bring your attention to 200.437. So if you go into the regs, look for these criteria, 200.437, it will have employee health and welfare costs. And after you read that document, after you read that document, you can see specifically that it says that that particular cost is allowable. 200.445 goods and services for personal use. So any goods and services incurred for personal use is specifically unallowable per the regs. And this is for direct or indirect. Always it's going to be specifically unallowable. And then also, if you go to 200.441, fines, penalties, damages, and other settlement, it says in the regs that these are conditionally allowable, meaning that sometimes they're allowable, sometimes they're unallowable. One of the reasons that will make fines, penalties allowable is that you get a pre-authorization from the grantor or the funding agency, meaning that you reach out to the funding agency, say, based on uh, administering this program, we may incur some fines and penalties in the beginning. So will it be okay for us to incur these penalties? If you get pre-authorization to incur them, you can charge those to the federal war. However, it must be a direct charge. If there's no pre-authorization, those costs will be unallowable. Next slide, please. Now let's talk a little bit about the Negotiated Indirect Cost Rate Agreement or the NICRA. Next slide, please. Now there are two types of indirect cost reimbursement option. However, there are more than two allocation methodologies. But for this presentation, we believe that these two will be the easier to implement and sufficiently accommodate an organization that is new to indirect cost accumulation and allocation processes. So the first option is the NICRA or the Negotiated Indirect Cost Rate Agreement. This is an agreement with your organization's cognizant agency to charge indirect costs to all awards based on a self-prepared and cognizant agency reviewed and approved indirect cost rate proposal. The second option is the de minimis rate, which is a 10% flat rate that OMB allows an organization to apply to a base of modified total direct cost. Now, for this training series, option two, the de minimis rate is the preferred and recommended option for the participants of the DCTA program because of the ease of implementation, preparation, and monitoring of the rate usage. Next slide, please. Now, let's talk about the process related to the NICRA and what it takes to prepare a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. First off, the NICRA is the approved document agreement to charge a rate to federal awards based on a subrecipient or recipients submitted and approved indirect cost rate proposal or ICRP. The approval will come from the recipients or the subrecipient cognizant agency. The ICRP is based on actual costs supported by audited financial statements. It requires the organization to be able to support all costs indicated as allowable in the ICRP and the ICRP or, in, uh, or indirect cost rate proposal must be updated and prepared annually and submissions to the cognizant agency for approval may be required. The indirect cost rate is the allowable indirect cost as the numerator 
and the allowable direct cost that is the denominator and it is expressed as a percentage. Now, as you can see, the NICRA option is significantly more labor intensive, requires more regulated, uh, regulatory oversight and a thorough understanding of your organization cost criteria. Next slide, please. Now, let's talk about the 10% de minimis rate. Again, this is the preferred methodology that we will, uh, in this training series, our DCTA participants, we want them to implement and utilize for the very purpose of its simplicity as related to preparing a NICRA. Next slide, please. So, de minimis rate. Who can use this methodology? Per 200414F of uh, the Uniform Administrative Requirement, it says that any non federal entity that does not have a current negotiated rate or NICRA may elect to charge the de minimis rate and may use it indefinitely. There are some exceptions per Appendix 7, paragraph D.1. Non-federal entities receiving more than $35 million of direct federal funding cannot elect the de minimis rate. Next slide, please. So back to those criteria for election. Here it says no current NICRA. If you don't have a current NICRA, you can use the de minimis rate and less than $35 million of direct federal funding. You can use the de minimis rate. And this authorized you or the organization to use a flat 10% rate to apply to modified total direct cost or MTDC. Now, unlike the NICRA process, unlike the NICRA process, the organization do not have to define the allowable indirect cost because it's predetermined to be 10% of modified total direct cost. Now let's talk about modified total direct cost and what it is. First off, modified total direct cost, let's talk about what it includes. Modified total direct cost is the base, meaning that these are the direct activities that incur in order to administer all your awards, all your programs, all your projects. And modified total direct cost has a has criteria for allowability and eligibility for cost in this um, in this space. And the first thing that modified total direct cost includes is all direct salaries and wages, applicable fringe benefits. Those are fringe benefits that are applicable to those direct salary and wages that are charged directly to those programs and projects. Any direct materials and supplies are allowable in modified total direct cost calculation. Services, professional services that are performed for the benefit of those uh, programs are allowable. The travel costs that you incurred uh, for those uh, professional services are allowable or travel costs just in general that benefited directly those uh, services are allowable. And subawards up to the first 25,000 of each subaward or subcontract. So that's basically saying that if you have a subcontract or subaward that is in excess of $25,000, only the first $25,000 is included in modified total direct cost base. The remainder, the remainder is disallowed regardless of however much it is. The, only the first $25,000 is allowed. Now let's talk about what modified total direct cost excludes. And it excludes equipment costs, capital expenditures, charges for patient care, rental costs, tuition remission, scholarships and fellowships, participant support costs, and the portion of each subaward in excess of $25,000. Now, there is a caveat here for 
the uh, cognizant agency. And it basically says here that if there is an inequity, meaning it's inequality in the base, and it appears that a federal award may be charged too much based off of an amount that's in the modified total direct cost that has been deemed allowable, your college agency has the authority to remove it. So Congress agency can review your modified total direct cost base and ensure that there is no inequality as it relates to charging the 10% de minimis rate to the awards. And the final thing here, we wanted to make sure we give you a good explanation of what is a non-federal entity. As you see, a non-federal entity can be pretty much anything, state, local government, Indian tribe, institution, higher education, non-profit organization, pretty much anything as long as it's not federal. Next slide, please. Now, what for the 10% de minimis rate, what supporting documentation do my organization need to accumulate in its financial management system to support the use of the 10% de minimis rate? Now, let's start off with per, uh, personnel compensation, which is located in 2 CFR Part 200 438i, and the standards for documentation of the personnel expenses. First thing you have to maintain is that charges to the federal award for salary and wages must be based on records that actually reflect actual work performed. And these are time sheets or personnel activity reports based off of actual work performed for that individual that's charging to that uh, activity or that program or that project or that award. Next, salary and wages costs must be supported by a system of internal controls providing reasonable insurance that the charges are accurate, allowable, and allocated. Internal controls are things like signatures on your personnel activity report on timesheet by the employee and the employee supervisor or manager. Internal controls, they're basically certifying that the information on that timesheet is in fact accurate and complete. And then lastly, salary and wages must, salary and wages costs must reflect total activity for the employees in which they're being compensated. So all hours must be documented on the personnel activity report and timesheet for which the employee was paid. Next slide, please. All right. Now, what are the criteria? These are additional criteria for supporting modified total direct cost base. And now we want to go to 20302, which talks about the financial management aspect. And here we're saying that the non federal financial management system must be sufficient to permit the preparation of reports required by general and program specific terms and conditions. And it also must have sufficient documented evidence to trace the funds to a level to ensure that the expenditures are adequately are adequate and to establish that the funds have been used in accordance to the federal regulations and terms and conditions of the federal award. So that information must be in your financial management system to trace those funds to ensure that the federal award and the cost that you incur to administer those federal award met the general requirements of the federal awards. And you, have to, and you may have to support that during a review, doing, doing a program review to ensure that the federal award accomplished the mission and goal that it was set out to do. And then finally, after you're able to uh, document these costs and then you're able to trace these costs, you need to be able to retain these um, documents to show that you in fact did in fact meet the requirements of the federal award. And 200.334 talks about the retention requirements. And here it says that you need to maintain 
these documents, these expenditure documents for a program, project, or award for at least three years after the final expenditure report has been submitted. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about the, um, the computation of the 10% de minimis rate and how we would compute that, uh, how we would identify that um, in, a, um, in a schedule. So if we look at all the way to the left, you have your cost descriptions and those cost descriptions are those specific descriptions that's identified in um, the definition for modified total direct cost. And it talks about these descriptions as allowable, I mean, as excluded and unexcluded for modified total direct cost. And I just put those in all the way as the cost description. And then the next three uh, columns, we identified the award, the direct program award. So we got federal uh, participation for this program, state participation and local participation. And then finally, the fourth column is the total cost of the program, including all the participants' uh, cost that was all the participant cost that was incurred by each of these agencies. And the total program cost is $778,750. And then what we did here, we identified the cost that is allowable per modified total direct cost. And we used the definition of modified total direct cost to determine what is allowable. And we determine what part of the, um, the cost that incurred this program was attributable, was unallowable per modified total direct cost. And we identify that as $205,650. The combination of allowable and unallowable modified total direct costs add up to the total program cost. So let's start at the top with we, and I start with salary and wages, and we identify the salary and wages. It's $385,000 of total program cost. And per the regs for modified total direct cost, salary and wages is 100% allowable. Therefore, we put all the salary and wages in modified total direct cost base. Fringe benefits, $77,000. Per the regs, fringe benefits attributable to the salary and wages that was charged to the program directly are allowable for per four modified total direct costs. So all the fringe benefits has been added to the base. Material and supplies, per the regs, material and supplies directly charged are allowable. So 100% of the material and supplies were charged. Subcontracts, there's approximately $200,000 total program subcontract cost. However, per regs, only $25,000 of each subcontract uh, cost is allowable. And here is only one subcontract. It was a total of $200,000. Therefore, only $25,000 of the $200,000 is allowable in the indirect cost. I'm sorry, in the modified total direct cost base. And therefore, the remaining $175,000 of that single contract is totally excluded from the base. Services, professional services here, grand total of $12,900, of which all of it is allowable per the um, uh, regs for modified total direct costs, travel costs, $8,500, all of it is allowable. Now let's go down to rental costs, tuition remission, scholarships and fellowship, and participant support costs. None of those costs are allowable because the regs expressly states that those costs are unallowable. So we excluded all of those costs as it relates to those particular cost descriptions. Now we've got a grand total of 573,100 as allowable modified total direct costs and a grand total of 205,650 as unallowable modified total direct cost. Now, all these costs can be charged directly to the program. However, for modified total direct cost determination 
to the base, the only thing that's allowable is 573,100. So that means that only the 10% de minimis uh, rate can be charged to allowable modified total direct cost, which is 573,100. Next slide, please. Now here's the computation of modified total direct cost base and how we apply the 10% to the allowable modified total direct cost base. Now you can take 10% just in total is 10% of 573,100, give you 57,310, or you can add, you can take 10% times each of the line item that's allowable, 10% of salary and wages, 10% of fringe benefits, 10% of material and supplies, still going to come up with 57310 as allowable indirect costs that you're going to get reimbursed for those intrinsic costs that you incur in your organization that benefited this federal, state, and local um, program that was actually this, this program that was funded by federal, state, and local dollars. So you can get a maximum of $57,310 of indirect um, reimbursement for those uh, costs that benefited this program. Next slide, please. Here, we want to, I want to show you how to prepare a budget because a budget needs to be submitted with your grant agreement, showing how you're going to expend your um, federal funds. So in this particular uh, presentation, we identified that the total grant is $100,000. Because you're charging a 10% de minimis rate on your modified total direct cost base, it will not afford you the opportunity to increase your federal funding from $100,000 to $110,000. You have to identify the portion of direct activity and the portion of an indirect activity that is allowable to be charged at 10% or a portion of direct activity that is being allowed to charge 10% on. And then the combination of the two has to add up to your program budget or your grant or your grant funds of $100,000. So let's walk through this, um, this example and let me show you how we prepared it. So this is something that you can put together for your grant agreements. Again, the categories are the exact same because these are, again, the excluded and included uh, cost descriptions as it relates to allowable and unallowable for modified total direct cost. We identified our total budget here of 91,986.36. This is our total budget. This is how we're going to distribute these direct costs. And these are total direct cost budget here of 91,986. Now, what part of this 91,986 is allowable per modified total direct cost? And that's 80,136,036. I'm sorry, $80,136.36. That's allowable per modified total direct cost. What's unallowable is 11,850. So we identified that $80,000 meet the criteria for modified total direct cost. So we can charge 10% on that base. So if we look at that base of 80,000, 10% on that base of 80,000, 136 will give you a indirect cost reimbursement of $8,013. And if then if you look at it on the individual criteria basis, you can look at salary and wages, 24,000. Again, allowable per the criteria, per the uh, criteria to CFR part 200, 10% of that, add those two together, come up with $26,400 of cost that's gonna be charged for salary and wages to the award. Same thing for fringe benefits. We identify allowable fringe benefits. 
$4,080. 10% of that is 408. Add the two together, $4,488 of allowable costs that can be charged to your award. And that's direct and indirect. And the same thing goes for material and supplies, 9,750 plus 975, 10,725. Subcontracts, $32,000 is in the total direct budget. However, only $25,000 is allowable. Talk about that. So only $2,500 is included in the indirect cost, 10% de minimis reimbursement. So you get a grand total of $34,500 that can be charged on this line item. And it proceeds all the way down to the things that are now allowable, and that's equipment cost of rental and persist, uh, participant support costs. Now, we identified that the allowable modified total direct cost is um, $80,000, 10% the minimum rate on that is $8,013. So we take our total direct budget, which is 91,986, plus the 10% uh, reimbursement for those indirect and transit costs that benefited this award, add those two together, you'll come up with $100,000. The $100,000 is the same amount of the grant amount that was funded for this particular program. So you can see you can actually charge direct and indirect and still stay within the, um, the program award amount. Next slide, please. And let's talk a little bit about the benefits of implementing the 10% de minimis rate. Next slide, please. Now, some of the uh, benefits of implementing the 10% de minimis, rate, de minimis rate, first thing is it eliminates administrative barriers to receiving reimbursement for indirect costs. Now, if you're using the NICRA, the NICRA has to be approved by the cognizant agency. They have to go through the uh, indirect cost pool to make sure that everything in the pool meets the requirements of 2 CFR Part 200. And they have to make sure the things in the base meet the requirements of 2 CFR Part 200. So if you use the 10% de minimis rate, that's not a requirement. The only thing <clears throat> that if the Congress they decide to do, if they want to look through it, they can look through the modified total direct cost base. However, that's not a requirement for them to do that type of review. Also, recipients cannot prevent subrecipients from using the de minimis rate if they're eligible. The grant agreement must include provisions to allow use of the de minimis rate. So in your grant agreement, there should be a... Um, a um, Citation that talks about indirect costs, and it should talk about whether you can use, you can charge indirect costs to this award or not. And in most grant agreements, uh, indirect costs is allowable. Uh, and also, it's an efficient way to reimburse smaller organizations for indirect costs. And the smaller organizations that receive less than $35,000, $35 million of direct federal funding. Again, $35 million of direct federal funding. And then no documentation is required with voucher reimbursement requests if you're using the 10% de minimis rate. And then finally, if you're using the 10% de minimis rate, there's no proposal necessary. So you don't have to identify what your indirect cost pool is or your indirect or, or your direct cost base here. It's already predetermined. Now, once you elect the 10% de minimis rate, you can use the rate indefinitely and consistently for all awards until you decide to negotiate an indirect cost rate proposal that ultimately become a NICRA that is approved by your cognizant agency. Next slide, please. Additional benefits of using a 10% de minimis rate is basically you get reimbursement of costs that benefit multiple programs 
which may not otherwise be recovered. So these are these intrinsic costs in your organization that's administrative in nature that benefited many programs. And you can get some portion of that cost reimbursed to you based off of the benefit derived from that particular program or that, that directly on that particular program. Then it increased recovery of all costs and builds and increases organizational sustainability. As you get reimbursed for those intrinsic costs in your organization, it helps ensure the longevity of your organization to, and to allow your organization to continue to run these programs for future periods. And then also identification of program cost drivers allows management to make more informed decisions. After when you identify where those major cost drivers are in your organization, that allows management to identify resources that's going to be there to ensure that those programs and those activities have sufficient resource in order to run appropriately. And then lastly, it improved cash flow for grantees and subrecipients with multiple programs. And of course, if you're getting reimbursed for those indirect activities, the cash flow is going to be better to allow you to uh, fund more programs in order to help and sustain the community. Next slide, please. Cost objectives. Now, in order to recover indirect costs, an organization must distinguish between direct costs and indirect costs in its financial management system. And this is done via cost objectives. Next slide, please. Now, what are cost objectives? Cost objectives are programs, functions, activities, awards, organizational subdivision, contracts, or work units for which cost data are desired and for which provisions are made to accumulate and measure the cost of processes, products, jobs, capital projects, et cetera. So basically, cost objectives are just buckets of costs in which to, in which they identify as indirect or direct, and they identify as to where those costs are attributable to. That's basically what a cost objective is. So typically here, if we want to say, think about HUD, a typical cost objective is a HUD award. So if you're charging to a specific HUD award, cost objective, we know that these costs is for that specific award. For a HUD project, if you charge to a specific project, those costs are, should be applicable to that project only. Or activity, same thing, you charge to a specific activity, those costs should be uh, applicable to the activity only. So those are cost objectives and cost objective goes down to, into various degrees. Next slide, please. And here's a cost objective example. And let's start, we're starting at a single city department. And this city department in this example has two federal wars and federal war number one, federal war number two. Those are cost objectives. It could stop right there as cost objectives. So you can charge all your costs to, you can charge costs applicable to federal war to federal war number one, costs applicable to federal war number two, will be charged to federal award number two. And you can say, you know what? These are the costs that benefit these awards. But this particular example goes down to another level. We identify the programs that were benefited from the federal award number one and the federal award number two. So now there's a home program repair for federal award number one, home ownership for federal award number two, I'm sorry, home ownership of federal ward number one, two programs. And then we got two programs for federal ward number two, economic development, community development, nonprofit capacity building. 
So now we have six different cost objectives here, and you can drill down to get additional details as it relates to federal war number one. What's the cost for the home program repair? Everything for home program repair, federal war number one would be in that program. Same thing for federal war number two. What is the cost for community development? Nonprofit capacity building. All the costs associated with community development would be captured in that cost objective. Showing that we can drill down even further for details for each one of the programs. Now we have projects, tasks, or activities, however you want to call them. Under the home program repair, the activities are housing inspection, home program support, environmental reviews. Under economic development, under federal award number two, we got three activities as well, acquire property. So the cost to acquire property would be captured there. Business plans, any business plan costs would be captured there. And technical workshops, any costs associated with technical workshops would be captured there. If we run reports in our financial management system and we want to say how much cost for economic development was incurred for business plan. We should be able to run a code that identified the business plan cost and I tell you exactly how much that was. And then we can add those, all three of those together, acquire property, business plan, technical workshop, add those together, you get the total cost of economic development. And then we can add up the total cost for economic development, community development, nonprofit capacity building, and those two add up, including all the tasks, and you would get the total amount of federal award number two. So again, these are all your cost objectives, and you should be able to trace these costs back to the actual program costs to show that, to show any review on how those federal funds were expended to ensure that those federal funds were expended in order to meet the mission in which the, um, the grant was administered. Next slide, please. Now, some key points for cost allocation that we want you to keep in mind. First point is that indirect cost tends to be support costs. And these support costs are usually things like telephone, printing, and rents. Direct costs can be traced directly to projects or activities that gave rise to the cost. So if a cost is specifically identifiable to a specific cost objective, that cost will be deemed direct. Example will be construction costs for a public facility. You pay for construction, you build a public facility, those are direct costs, easily identifiable. Indirect costs are real costs and must be paid for from some revenue source for an organization to maintain functionality, stability, and longevity. And the allocation of indirect costs does not increase federal funding for a significant portion of grantees. Case in point, when we looked at our budget, we noticed that we identified the portion of direct costs total direct cost per the budget, the 10% de minimis rate indirect activity that benefited, the combination of the two did not exceed the total amount of the grant. That's what that particular um, citation is discussing. Next slide, please. Okay, let's have a few cost allocation knowledge checks. And the first one is the cost principles per 2 CFR part 200 subpart E are those cost principles that allow an organization to determine the cost for a specific activity and the cost chargeable to federal award. And these cost principles are to be used for direct costs and indirect costs. Second, cost principles for the federal government, local government and nonprofit organization are similar. They are, however, they are not identical. 
Recipients and subrecipients should ensure they are using the appropriate appendix of 2 CFR Part 200, depending on the type of entity they are, in order to determine their um, indirect cost um, plan or eligibility. And then finally, then also you're told there's two suggested options for reimbursement of indirect costs by a non-federal entity. And the first one is the NICRA or the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, which is a little more labor intensive than the 10% recommended de minimis rate uh, that we are recommending for uh, our DCTA participants. And basically here, if you don't have a current NICRA and you receive less than $35 million of direct federal funding, the 10% de minimis rate can be utilized by your organization. We talk about the purpose and benefits of indirect costs and the NHS by actually incurring indirect costs on your uh, programs and projects. It just helps the long-term sustainability of your organization and basically ensures that these programs can be ran for the community uh, deep into the future. We talk about the financial management system, those cost objectives, how you know how you can drill down to the various cost objectives to get down to the very detail of each one of the program from the task activity program uh, grant level, just to show you exactly how those costs were incurred. And then it shows you how you can trace those costs to show how they benefited the award. And then also you need to have some determination on how you will determine a direct cost from an indirect cost and that you can use the uh, regs of 2 CFR part 200 to help you with those determinations, subpart E, which was the cost principles. And of course the resources of 2 CFR part 200 is always beneficial to allow you to get a clear understanding of how costs should be captured and determined in your organization. Next slide, please. 